Uh, so if you don't want to be on the recording, you can go ahead and uh, stop your video, um, which is that control is at the bottom of your screen on your Zoom window. Next to the mute button, there's going to be a little picture of a camcorder. If you click it, you'll turn off your video and then you won't be uh, included in the, in the recording. Um, we're just bringing a few more people in from the waiting room. Thank you for spending your evening with us uh, tonight talking about the Chicago budget. This is the second uh, time we've talked about the budget. We spoke about it uh, with Alderman uh, Waxback and Martin over the summer. And now that it is nearing time to actually pass that budget, we've uh, asked them to come back and kind of brief us and update us on what's in the new budget, what uh, what's being worked on, and uh, what to expect over the next uh, five weeks in as we uh, get our 2021 budget in place. Uh, as always, this evening, our host is Good Government Illinois' David Orr. And my name is Morgan Harris. I'm with uh, Acacia Consulting Group and Good Government Illinois. And uh, we work with David and Good Government Illinois on producing events just like this one. So I am going to turn it over to David to get us started this evening. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Uh, welcome to Good, uh, Good Government Illinois. If you haven't followed us before, quite simply, our goals are to protect democracy and expand uh, people's right to vote, uh, to advance best practices, including discourage some bad practices when it comes to running government more efficiently, and of course, to elect good people who can carry out those ends. Um, tonight, we revisit, because um, we did one of these a few months before, as Morgan said, the challenges Chicago officials are facing, mostly in this case, the aldermen and the mayor, in trying to pass a budget in wake of one, the COVID crisis, which is incredible, uh, a serious economic downturn, uh, over $1 billion deficit, which means that normal taxes that come in, at least in many areas, are significantly down, a skyrocketing COVID co uh, cost that will continue, unfortunately, for a foreseeable future. Um, at this point, little federal relief uh, and just many, many thousands of uh, people, renters, landlords, businesses who are suffering. Um, and so the question is, what, how, how do we develop a budget that can pass the city council uh, that is balanced because legally it has to be, unlike the federal government, it has to be balanced um, and minimizes uh, the incredible inequities, if it can, that we've, expo uh, we've seen because of the COVID that's made it dramatically clear to so many people the inequities in our society. Uh, and finally, are we using the resources uh, uh, as good as possible to get the money where they're most needed? Uh, our two guests are two uh, the bright lights in Chicago City Council. Uh, one is a Scott Wagaspak, who um, is the finance chair, and they're very busy with this. Uh, he's been all of them since 2007. He got his law degree from Kent here in Chicago. He has a very interesting career um, in the Peace Corps and a lot of international activities. Uh, Kenya, he worked with UNICEF on various women's groups for building health clinics and water supplies. He also, back here in the States, was a city administrator and chief of staff uh, for a local mayor, Michael O'Connor in Berwyn, um, and uh, many, many other great things, but I will keep them short. Um, and we also have Matt Martin, um, who is a new alderman, just elected uh, last year uh, in the 47th Ward. Um, uh, Matt is a civil rights attorney um, who worked in the Attorney General's office here in Illinois and a number of issues he worked on, including uh, very relevant things for the city council, police reform, immigration, health care, workers' rights, uh, many, many important things. Uh, we like to kind of kid him about his undergraduate degree, which is in jazz studies, uh, as well as political science. And then um, he got his uh, law degree through Harvard. Um, so welcome, Matt and Scott. Um, let, let me get kind of right to it here. That uh, Let's start with the procedure. For those people who are not following this stuff every day, um, tell us about what happened this week. There's been committee meetings. And at some point, uh, what happens next? 
uh, when people have to vote, um, what other things should we know? We do know that we have to have a budget uh, by the end of the year, and usually it's done around this time. So, right, I'll jump in. Um, so, as you know, David, from from years past and uh, doing these kind of budgets. Uh, you get the proposals out at the front end and then it comes up to the, uh, you know, a couple, three weeks before where we go through the budget hearings and everyone gets to weigh in on what they think um, the budget should change. Uh, Alderman Pat Dowell or Chairwoman Dowell was running the budget committee for that. And um, this year was pretty exceptional because of the pandemic. Obviously everything's being done by Zoom, um, which makes it a little more difficult because in years past at the council, you could always kind of go in the back and talk to a department, um, not only about your individual issues in your ward, but also to kind of, um, you know, after the fact, sit down with them and kind of go through and get uh, deputies or some staff members to really work through some of those issues with you. It's, it's a lot more difficult now. Um, and then this week, uh, um, you know, yesterday we went through the... Um, Finance Committee, which was very interesting. Um, we have the Revenue Ordinance, we have the Management Ordinance, and so our two committees um, work to try to pass those in an appropriate way, look at different possible amendments, and then we've got the uh, City Council meeting for the final votes next week on Tuesday. Um, and I think this one's been a pretty tough road for the mayor. Um, I think she's probably, you know, uh, Taken, taken this pretty seriously, um, but had to change some of the things that she's done. And, and really, uh, as I've kind of pushed, you know, just take a breather for a second. And um, during this pandemic, when everybody's hyped up on Zoom meetings, uh, just kind of sit back and listen to what people have to say, listen to what their concerns are uh, before we pass this final vote. So um, if that schedule continues, you could be done before Thanksgiving. If not, you'd be coming back in early December, I assume. Um, yeah, and state law basically says we have to have a, a, a budget passed before the last Tuesday of December. Um, after that, I, I think you might have seen in the past, you know, you really run into some, some fiscal problems with the state controller and, you know, potential for takeover and things like that. But that's pretty far down the path. But we, in the past, we've always tried to get them done before Thanksgiving. Um, you know, and I think uh, definitely by the first week of December. Except in 1984, <laughs> we passed the budget about 1030, December 31st. Verdoliak uh, put up a good fight all the way till then. I know that because you've heard that story. My son Jeffrey was about to be born. My wife said, come on, we got to go to the hospital. I uh, call here. Hey, no, he can't leave yet. We don't have the votes. <laughs> Hang in there. Finally, sometime after 10 o'clock, okay, you could leave. We got the votes. And uh, that's why Jeffrey was born in 1985 rather than 1984. But uh, tell us a little bit before we um, go into more stuff um, uh, in terms of the revenue package. Just, uh, you know, one of you go through it um, in terms of we, we know that's where the property tax increase comes in. But altogether, it's what, 190 million or something like that? The property tax increase is actually 94 million. Um, a large portion of that is loss of collection. So in the past, what, when we didn't have um, payments made for property taxes, um, we could take a sort of a, a delay on paying those into the pension funds. But um, with some new laws passed, we have to pay into the pension funds so they calculate it as loss of collections. That's about 40 some odd million. Um, the other portion is for new properties that have come online in the year and that's uh, about 16 million. And then the rest is the CPI increase, which uh, has, you know, it has some interesting uh, aspects to it. It basically creates a CPI adjustment um, for the overall uh, property tax levy and it's a 5% cap, but what we're, um, looking to see is if, if we're at the average, it's about 1.8%. The only thing I would say about that is, you know, in the years past when we when we got these big property tax hikes, um, I think the big last one we did was in 2015, that was 588 million. And because of the pension holidays and, and lack of really focus on the, the pensions back going back to the daily era, 
um, we've been stuck with some pretty hefty bills that we have to pay to, to keep up with um, the pension payments. So that uh, CPI, I think, lends a little bit of predictability. I don't think a lot of aldermen are happy with it, but um, I would almost rather know that I'm going to have a smaller bill year to year than get stuck with uh, a massive increase like we saw in some of those previous years. And remind me, what's the total revenue package? Um, the, well, the total, uh, the total on the whole thing is a little over 9 million or 9 billion for the city. Um, if you break up, I, and I didn't go through the whole revenue package, but there's things in there like parking meters. Um, I'm getting actually a lot of new parking meters for the first time in a few years. Um, there's elimination of a rideshare subsidy to the CTA. They're actually doing their own capital plan. Um, so those funds would be folding back into the city. That's about 16 million, a cloud tax increase, which is probably appropriate for all the Zoom we're doing. Um, and then there's the lead line replacement program and several other um, pieces in there. Um, some goofy things like increasing harbor fees that haven't been changed since the 1960s for things like dragging. If you're David, if you're dragging your uh, your anchor and you hit some stuff underground, you know, in the in the harbor, you're going to get a fine. So, okay, Matt, did I interrupt you? Were you going to say something before? Yeah, I was. I was just going to say one final thing about the CPI increase, which is um, my understanding, in part based on the budget briefings that we've had publicly and privately, is that um, we still have to vote every year on the levy increase. So I think. Um, the proposed CPI increase is something that does lend to a level of predictability. I assume um, at least some, if not all of the rating agencies will like that in terms of the city gesturing a in subsequent years, here's what we're looking at from a structural perspective, but it is still something where you can uh, go generally above or below that. So um, I think that it's, I'll be very interested to see in these subsequent years, the degree to which the council uses that CPI increase as a sort of baseline, as opposed to, nope, it's still every year, there's gonna be a, a big conversation around that. And um, I think a final thing that is worth emphasizing is as challenging as this year's budget has been that 1.2 billion gap, next year's budget may potentially be more challenging. The projected deficit right now is 1.5 billion. So a little bit more than the current or next the next fiscal year. Um, and the pension ramp is, is much larger as well. This past year is a, a bit under 200 million for fiscal year 2022. However, it looks to be about 399 million. Um, so the degree to which we're able to bounce back from COVID um, in, in two ways. One, uh, the revenue, because we've lost uh, close to 800 million projected. Um, but then when we're also talking about what sort of uh, form the federal stimulus takes, especially if unlike the CARES Act, we're able to use a portion or all of those federal funds as a revenue replacement will be absolutely critical because I think worst case scenario, we don't get the sort of federal assistance that we need and that we're in the same position, if not slightly worse from a budget standpoint. So I, I've appreciated being new that that's been a part of the conversation. I think that there are ways to improve that in terms of thinking about things, not just in the immediately subsequent fiscal year, but in a multi-year period, maybe in a four-year term is probably an appropriate way of thinking about it so that we can better understand the ways in which the decisions we're making for fiscal year 2021 impact the immediate subsequent years. Okay, let me um, tie together two questions um, well, that have been asked by a number of our um, guests out there today, uh, um, basic and related. So um, let's kind of talk about progressive versus regressive taxes. So what, what do we think of progressive taxes? What are some of the regressive taxes? And what other options um, might we have? Or even some that maybe are not workable right now. Um, so. I'm, I'm happy to start off there. I guess at bottom, when I think about progressive revenue, broadly speaking, I look at it as um, an approach whereby we ask people um, to contribute um, in a way that reflects their ability to do so. And so I think probably not too much dispute that a uh, progressive income tax structure, for example, is quite progressive. Um, and 
Uh, conversely, flat taxes, um, especially things that um, fall disproportionately on folks of modest means, um, are, are less progressive, are regressive. Um, I think in this particular budget cycle, we have very few options to bring on new progressive revenue. Um, I think there are several reasons for that. One being the failure of the flat tax has meant that there are lots of ways in which we will continue to be unable to look at income in any meaningful way when we want to either modify existing revenue streams or bring on new ones. A second big hurdle is the fact that Springfield hasn't met in a meaningful way since earlier this year. So even something that has generated broad agreement in terms of a progressive structure for the real estate transfer tax, the tax that's applied when you sell property. Um, so think about your million dollar homes, your multi-million dollar skyscrapers. It's a flat tax regardless of that compared to say a condo or a single family home that sells for a hundred or $200,000. So we don't have a lot of options in the current budget cycle in that from a progressive standpoint, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will change in advance of next year. But I think we're starting, I'm starting to really come to terms with the negative impact that the fair tax will have, not just on Springfield and the state, which I think is broadly known, the almost $4 billion budget gap that they're going to have to deal with, but also from a, a city standpoint. And, and one example I want to bring up is I think it's great when colleagues like Scott and others um, will look at what other cities are doing, right? Because we don't have to treat ourselves like a unicorn all the time. San Francisco um, just a few weeks ago passed a, a tax whereby they look at the wealth, the income disparity between a senior executives and your line employees, your, your average workers. And that if that income disparity reaches beyond a certain point that they're gonna apply a sort of tax. I think that's something that um, could generate some, some significant support in Chicago, but we can't do it because the, fair the flat tax is still in place. And as a result, we can't take income into account. So it's things like that where the, that fair tax vote will continue to leave us behind our other peer cities um, and so we're left to really rely on things like property taxes and other things where, you know, you, I think they're regressive in various ways. Of course, someone who has a million dollar home on average can contribute more than someone who has a $200,000 home. There are exceptions there, of course, but it's still um, a, a very challenging environment that won't go away soon. Right. Yeah. And I would add, um, you know, Matt mentioned Springfield and they haven't really met, but uh, I think we need a big push down there for our state legislators to look for some of these progressive revenue options. So one of the big ones that we've been pushing for years and the progressive caucus still on it is uh, expanding the service taxes. And with the failure of the fair tax, um, you know, one of those uh, service type uh, tax increases or expanding it would really bring a lot more revenue to the state as a whole and, and to allow the city to um, expand that. And, you know, that's not gonna go over well with lawyers or people like that, but, you know, we don't, uh, we don't do what other states do. Um, not only do we not have a fair tax, but we don't have, uh, I think from the inspector general's report a few years ago, um, but the average was something like 50 to 60 other uh, types of service taxes on different parts of you know industry that we don't have here in Illinois. Um, the other thing uh, that we've been working on is the pilot uh, payment in lieu of taxes. And even though the administration didn't move it forward this year in the budget, um, they put together a task force which has progressive aldermen on it. And I think we're gonna start looking at how we figure out how to negotiate with the universities or the hospital systems that have these properties offline uh, that don't pay the property taxes that we need to put into the system. Um, that's going to be tricky, but I think it's good to see we're moving on that. And then uh, I think with Fritz Kage really tackling the issues in the assessor's office, um, I think the thing that makes me feel good is seeing you know, the, the squeeze put on guys like uh, Ed Burke and Madigan when it comes to the appeals process on their properties. Um, you know, I keep going back to that Trump Tower, how Ed Burke, you know, got him a six million dollar decrease in his in his taxes, um, you know, per year. So instead of paying, you know, roughly 10 million over three year period, he's paying three. 
Um, so it's things like that we've got to put a stop to. And that's that's maybe not by ordinance, but having somebody like Fritz Kage in the assessor's office is really going to help the city when it comes to challenging those uh, types of appeals. One final thing that I want to add, um, sorry, not, from, not mentioned this earlier, is I think areas where we need to get creative in addition to pilot, like Scott mentioned, places like Boston bring in, I think, upwards of $25 million, which are significant, right, when you're looking at especially the sorts of property tax increase buckets that Scott was mentioning just a minute ago. Um, in an absolute term, 25 million might not seem all that big, but um, it is for the issues that get the biggest press. I think one area that you're gonna continue seeing a lot of interest in in city council, um, and I'm sure the mayor's office as well, is the, um, uh, I think the, the delivery industry, um, like logistics when it comes to Amazon, Target, Walmart. Um, you had colleagues like Patrick Thompson, Byron Sicho Lopez, who introduced some revenue related ordinances. Um, we need to make sure that we're working through a lot of the legal issues in particular, so that we're not running afoul of federal preemption concerns, um, that there's uniformity that we're taking into account. But at the end of the day, we need to get creative and probably it requires working with Springfield, like Scott was mentioning, if it's things like excise taxes and otherwise, where we can look at those broad-based industries, not just one company like Amazon, but broadly and say, they are doing quite well during COVID, but probably moving forward. And as our main street communities continue to struggle, that it's appropriate for us to look to those industries and see what options there are to ask them to contribute more to keep us afloat. Okay, um, uh, let's uh, move ahead. Just um, it's complicated. But let's let's talk about the borrowing for a moment. Okay, um, um, Scott, you want to tackle that just quickly? Um, how are we helping to pay for this budget through borrowing? Um, and uh, is it really scoop and toss? Is it not? What do you think of it? Yeah, it is. It is a form of scoop and toss. Um, and I think the the difference that we see from years past is when when we were looking at in years past, they were doing swaps and scoop and toss, um, which is basically refinancing and pushing it down the road. We were doing things at variable rates, um, you know, that would go up and down depending on how the market was. Um, and we were taking a real beating on every time we did one of those refis. I, I think the the issue for us here is that, um, you know, you you can use scoop and toss in normal times, but you really shouldn't. Uh, in this situation with the pandemic, when your options are are so narrowed uh, down to to this option, it's not a bad idea. Um, the rating agencies, I think, have have looked at it and said, okay, um, all these cities that are out there that are taking a hit. You've got limited options. Uh, Chicago's even in a worse case because of our pension uh, system, you know, being underfunded. But I think, um, you know, the the difficult financial situation that we're in, they look at the refi and say, okay, um, you know, we can we can support this, but um, you know, it's got to come with it's got to come with the transparency that we need to see. It's got to come with ideas in the future to make sure that um, you don't just kick it you know, kick the can down the road and not fix your other structural problems. So amidst doing this refi, um, it looks like the rating agencies are looking at us saying, hey, um, you know, we're okay with it as long as you continue down the path of accountability and transparency. I'd add to that, that one, one important thing to keep in mind as well is that the sort of in particular restructuring, so not just the refinancing where we're just changing the rates, but the, the duration is, is locked in, but the more problematic scoop and toss aspects, I think that's the sort of thing that can be minimized or potentially done away with altogether, depending on when and how much federal aid we get. And so one of the um, series of conversations we were having in budget hearings and budget briefings is issuing, um, or I guess refinancing, restructuring in a series of tranches so that we can be nimble depending on what happens with the federal government. So it's important, again, to keep in mind that the budget that we're considering um, in city council right now is essentially the worst case scenario in terms of assuming we get no federal help 
We'll still need to make sure though, and do our jobs in terms of when hopefully that, that assistant comes in, assistance comes in that we're thinking really creatively around the best ways to allocate that, not in terms of, re, not just in terms of revisiting in particular the restructuring that's being proposed right now, um, but also uh, investments as well as thinking about next year's uh, problematic budget. Good, by How the way, you, you, just, you just answered one of the questions uh, uh, from you know, one of our viewers, so thank you. Um, um, and David, I'm sorry to interrupt. We just got, we got a, a great audience question that fits right in here. Sure. Um, the question is, uh, are there any reforms that can be made in the 2021 budget to cut expenses that are not necessarily service costs, but more waste reduction, uh, redundancy reductions, things like that? Um, I'll lead off. I mean, I think that there are, there's a degree of that already happening in terms of um, renegotiating contracts, um, considering, of course, with with regard to pandemic realities, significant cuts to um, travel expenses, even some minor things, which I think is is appropriate of looking at subscriptions and other things that department by department might not be significant, but in the aggregate are. Um, and I think when we're looking at vacancies as well, I think that's reflective of that, because if we are in a position where we're proposing a cut of 1900 vacancies, I think that stands to reason that at least for some period of time, um, we're not able to utilize those, um, those positions the way that people would expect. I think um, my perspective is we continue to have a problematic number of vacancies, even with uh, the budget that passed out of committees. And there continue to be concerns, especially with some of our larger departments that have a lot of entry level folks um, or vacancies where can we really staff up um, in the way that that budget envisions. So I think you've heard as a result this week, disagreements around um, whether we should be cutting additional vacancies, uh, what, what, which ones. Um, so I think, well, we need to have, in my opinion, more fulsome conversations, more year round discussions um, in terms of uh, like staff utilization in our various departments, especially our larger ones, including CPD, because I, I know that historically, and Scott can speak to this much better than I, there was a lot of um, shenanigans going on in terms of keeping those vacancies in place deliberately so that you um, were obfuscating exactly what was going on from an expenditure standpoint. We're certainly moving in the right direction that way, but a big thing I would tell folks to keep their eyes open for is there's a staffing analysis that's nearly complete from the University of Chicago Crime Lab for the police department. They're about 42% of the proposed corporate budget. So we need to be having at the city council level uh, a lot more fulsome conversation around um, how we're structuring uh, our, our personnel going forward. Just um, let me just make a quick comment on that because what Matt mentioned, and as a former alderman, it, uh, I really think it has great potential. Um, and I think a number of aldermen and the mayor have talked about this. Um, this idea of looking at contracts, you know, kind of like auditing TIFs, but really looking seriously at contracts, from my experiences, one could save a great amount of money. You could uh, even, even a hair airport, there's, there's contracts nobody even can keep track of. Um, and again, when you, it doesn't mean that someone's always doing something bad. It's just that, well, times change. And if you don't really review those carefully and audit them, uh, you may be paying more than you should, which is often the case. And there's other benefits that come through it. If, if we do a challenge and maybe change some of these contracts, there's probably a much better chance that we might have more uh, MBA participation, minority uh, participation, which would be helpful. So again, that it's not immediate. I mean, it could be immediate if they have, have the staff to work on it, but that is something if done really carefully, I think could be a big, big deal. Um, yeah. If I could jump in on that too, I think one of the biggest things that we've been pushing for for many years is looking at those contracts that get um, held over year after year. So they, a one-year extension that goes on for 10 years and nobody ever looks at it. And I think in the mayor's uh, budget, what they're anticipating is that uh, at least a, right off the bat, $10 million savings on several contracts um, just by looking at them and doing an RFP for the first time in years. And there's hundreds and hundreds of contracts like that. So um, I think it's important and we don't even know where they all are. I used to, in 
budgets passed under Daly and Rahm, I used to look sort of at the top 10 uh, contracts that everybody had, the, the big ticket items, and try to work through those and read the contracts and say, you know, why are you re re redoing this one this year again? Couldn't ever really get answers. Um, but it goes down to the small ones too. And, you know, out at the airport, they've, they've renegotiated out the airport. They've got better contracts out there as well. You know that those in many cases are, um, they used to be dumping grounds for contracts, you know, um, friends of friends contracts. And I think they're really gonna tackle that here. And then if I, um, on the bond deals, uh, my staff and I on the finance committee have really been trying to work with the finance department with the CFO and they've done a, a fantastic job. Um, David, I don't know what the numbers were back in the day, but you know, we have worked extensively over this last year to get more equity and inclusion uh, minority contractors into the legal teams and the bond deal teams. And we're up over 50% this year. And I think that's the first time that's ever happened. They've always languished down at the teens, the lower teens, you know, kind of inching their way up. But we made a concerted effort this year to do that. We have um, the highest that uh, percentages the, the city has ever seen on that. And a lot of things we're talking about, even though maybe it sounds sophisticated, it's really dealing with inequities, okay? Yeah. Almost everything we're talking about is uh, giving uh, other people maybe a fair check uh, for a chance to participate, more minority participation. So that's all good. Uh, let me uh, jump to TIFFs for a moment. Several people... Uh, ask questions. Let me just tie some together. Um, how much surplus we're going to get this year uh, from TIFFs? Uh, have there been many changes made to make TIFFs, uh, the process, more fair or transparent? Um, let's see. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and should we uh, see if we could end the program or significantly reduce uh, some of the TIFs we're getting and whether or not we expect should expect to see any increases in TIFs because of COVID. There's several different people asking questions on that. You mean increases in TIFs, the creation of them? Was that well, the question or no? Yeah, I mean, there was, I'm putting a lot together. It was some, well, are TIFs going to go up some? Uh, are TIFs going to go down? Uh, should we cancel it? Um, but the, the going up thing was the fear that maybe because of COVID, um, and therefore, the suffering out there, there might be more TIFs. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's realistic, but I'm just saying it's a series of different questions around TIFs. Well, I think with Paul tag team this one, I don't think the mayor's too keen at all to create any more TIFs. Um, and you saw the, the several that were created at the, in the last year of ROM or the last year and a half. Um, I, you know, I was, I was kind of pleased with the approach that the administration's been taking over the past year, uh, trying to do some clawbacks on TIF funding. Um, and I, in some cases, I didn't even know what was going on. Um, clawbacks? I mean, well, we, for instance, yeah, for instance uh, I'll give you a good example. I, I think it was in 2005, maybe there was a, a TIF for Grossinger uh, vehicles sales over at um, North and um, Halstead, essentially. It's the, the kind of the old building over there. And that was a $10 million TIF. And I found out the other day that uh, Grossinger had sold to another company and they didn't complete the uh, different aspects of requirements for that TIF. And this administration actually said, hey, let's go back and, and get that funding. And they filed to get those $10 million back because they had not completed the uh, TIF agreement, the RDA, what the requirements were. So um, you know, those are some aspects that I didn't know about that the administration is tackling, but uh, I don't see any new ones on the horizon. I think um, they are going to be terminating several this year. They terminated five last year, and there's aldermen that want to terminate several others. Um, I think what we obviously have to do is go through and see what those all are and, and have hearings on them to, to see if we can move forward on them. But um, I think they've done a good job. For instance, on the Sterling Bay Lincoln Yards TIF, they've been pushing back very hard there and, and looking at the language to try to make amendments to um, the way that was set up. Yeah, um, and I'll take uh, uh, some of the other questions. So uh, $304 million is what we're bringing into the city for surplus. I think overall of the system, it's a little over 900 million. 
So I know that CPS has its own set of issues, uh, quite a topic for another time um, with your organization, David, but um, they're, they're standing to see a lot of money from, from TIFF. Um, I'll be interested to see several things. Um, to Scott's point, whether we'll see more early sunsets um, that requires in part looking to see what the existing obligations look like over the next several years. So that can complicate or slow down the timeline for closing them early, but there are some, some benefits to at least keeping, keeping them on current track as opposed to extending them. Um, I'll also be interested to see whether it's uh, this next budget cycle or subsequently um, how we wanna utilize those excess funds because something that um, our colleague Daniel Espada had proposed to um, bring down part or all of the proposed property tax increase in this year was to borrow responsibly against our rainy day or draw upon our rainy day reserves, I should say, in a responsible way. And I say responsible because if you take, take money out and don't provide a path to replenishment, the rating agencies don't like that. It's essentially rating the bank and you're not putting the money back in. And they specifically like it when you can keep the rainy day funds to be approximately 20% of the overall corporate um, uh, fund expenditure. So we're right around there, 900 million right now. Um, so what he was proposing was that as the TIFs are scheduled to expire over the next 10 years, that that last bit of increment we um, use to replenish those funds. Um, so I thought that that was um, a, a responsible idea, especially given um, the property tax proposal. Um, the administration uh said that they've got different ideas in terms of how to use those TIF funds in the out years. So I'll be really interested to see, uh, learn more about those proposals, whether it's um, going to affect the next fiscal year that we talk about 2022 or beyond. Um, so as always, uh, stay tuned for more news about TIFs. Uh, let's just touch briefly um, on, um, well, whatever terms we want to use, defunding the police. But um, let's say Lorena had a question about Will there be increased removal of expenditures on CPD? Uh, I assume that, you know, um, in other words, uh, reductions, I assume what that is. Also, um, Judda asks, I don't support defining the police, but I do think that significant cuts to the police budget are possible with more funding for other projects. Let's just touch that briefly. And um, while you're at it, if I understand it right, I think in finance or budget, that um, the city council is going to come up with some pilot projects um, to encourage the use of uh, health professionals or people that can handle kind of crises um, rather than police. So any part of that one wants to tackle. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can lead off on that. Um, I think there are a few, so those are great questions and incredibly timely for a number of reasons. Um, maybe I'll take it in reverse in some way. So the, the, we've got two proposals that will likely be included in the final budget that gets passed. One has a law enforcement piece and one doesn't. Both of them envision going to deploying folks to respond to uh, certain uh, mental health related incidents uh, with calls for service. Um, one model in, in envisions that it's an officer working with a paramedic and a crisis worker. The other model um, that's gotten a lot of press recently in part through the work of our colleague, uh, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, is a non-law enforcement model that's being adopted in a lot of other places throughout the country. So um, it looks like we'll be allocating for both of those collectively a million dollars right now. It might go up, we'll see. So we'll be I'll be really interested to see how that works, especially the non-law enforcement model, because there are a lot of situations where we're asking officers, and Superintendent Brown has acknowledged this. I don't think it's a controversial point we're asking officers to respond to things that are not within their core set of responsibilities. And so it could be non, um, non-violent mental health issues. It could be noise complaints, moving violations. So when we're talking about how can we use our existing resources as efficiently as possible, in short, thinking about the staffing analysis that I mentioned earlier is kickstarting that conversation to see what are positions where you can have civilians do them in a way that's more effective, more efficient, especially from a, a money standpoint. And um, in turn, I think you would see a more nimble police department um, that's reflective of what you see in places like LA um, that has already had a consent decree like the one we have in place. 
Um, and then I'll let Scott talk about this more, but the sort of impact that that could in turn have on the settlements and judgments that we pay out. Um, so there's really a lot intertwined there, um, but, but I think there's a lot of work for city council to do in this coming year in that regard. Good. Yeah, I think the um, uh, hopping right into the question on the settlements. One thing that we've been doing with the settlement briefings is trying to make sure that we have all the different actors at the table uh, when it comes to uh, police violence or um, excessive force cases. For instance, uh, COPA, we now have COPA at all our meetings. We have a typically have one of the uh, police deputies um, and also make Quick, sure when it comes to Jack, COPA is for everybody. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, not COPA, COPA. Sorry, I said, did I say COPA? Um, police accountability, uh, basically the people who investigate excessive force or, or shootings. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is make sure that we have all the different uh, partners at the table to say, what, what role did you play in this? And then when we get through it, how are we going to fix um, these problems that keep reoccurring uh, when the aldermen are asked to pay for these settlements? So one of the things the mayor did that I thought was good um, was hire a chief risk officer. Um, she has since uh, moved on to uh, Zoom of all places, but um, they're going to be, they're already looking to hire a new person there. And that we were working very closely with that person to look at, for instance, search warrants and how those were being served. And um, there were a lot of procedural mistakes being made. Um, I think there were mistakes that uh, uh, were very obvious and could have been avoided, but they've led to millions and millions or tens of millions over the years and in police settlements. So those are the, you know, pinpointing the problems and then holding those officers accountable, which they've never really been held accountable. Um, you know, they, uh, Matt mentioned something about trying to tie uh, you know, some of those positions that we're, where we don't need officers doing paperwork or sitting there filing paperwork. Sometimes when those officers get in trouble, they're sent to headquarters to file paperwork. And I think you've seen that for decades. Um, that shouldn't be the place that they go just to sit around and do nothing. I mean, there has to be more accountability there as well. Um, to jump to another position that we've been pushing back on for many years, it's overtime, police overtime. And the inspector general did a good report a few years ago about um, two and a half years ago about how officers were signing off on officers overtime with their partner, you know, and that we were seeing huge bumps up in, in overtime spending that was just completely unnecessary. That is up to the superintendent, his staff to rein that in in a way that um, will reduce those costs as well. So there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of expenditures in the department we'd like to see change. And I think, um, Matt, I can't remember if you were on this or um, who, was, who was kind of leading it, but many of the progressive aldermen and others, Alderman Michelle Smith were saying, look, um, the, the juvenile intake system for the police department should be run by people from family services uh, or you know a third party entity, but the first place that kids at risk that get arrested, they shouldn't be going into a jail. They shouldn't be going into a facility that's completely staffed by police, but by people who can respond to their needs in a more appropriate way and keep them out of, keep them as diverted from the system as they can. So there's a lot of um, places there that we could put funding back in, but also remove funding. Um, as you know, the contract and the contract for the FOP is the place where I think we're going to get um, pretty significant change too, if we can have a good outcome with the arbitrator. Yeah, and you're just assuming that's that that's going to go to arbitration. I, I suppose that's a whole other. I should, yeah, I shouldn't. Uh, I should let them negotiate first. But um, well, public should probably understand that because uh, that, that's a likely thing, which means um, most people want to make the uh, union contract much more accountable in terms of particularly excessive force and so forth. Um, but in, in the real world, it most likely is going to go to an arbitrator. It's not so much, oh, well, uh, uh, you all and the mayor can just demand it of the union and get your way. So, yeah, it's unfortunately we can't do that. And I, I had a good meeting today with some, um, some constituents who had you know, a, a pretty good list of things that they wanted to see removed from the police budget. But I, I looked at them and I said, hey, 
I understand, but um, a lot of these are in the contract and like any other labor union, they have the same rights to negotiate and um, if it goes to arbitration to, to arbitrate that those issues. So unfortunately it's not up to us as aldermen just to say we're removing that um, without, without a good fight. Just one note, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, we had um, hoped to have Alderman Pat Dow uh, with us. Uh, she's terribly busy, obviously, with her work uh, in the budget committee. So uh, hopefully we get in the future. I know we don't have a lot of time left, um, um, but one of the questions, and it's, it's a, probably a pretty important one to all of you, uh, tell us just a little bit about the capital uh, development plan. And people may or may not understand how that works, but it's kind of a whole separate item. So tell us about that and is it being well received? Uh, I would say, you know, I just, it, it, I it's interesting. Here I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's a, um, it wasn't well received, let's put it that way. I think um, the, the administration, and I'm not sure where this came from, but they kind of tied uh, some more funding to our menus. And our menus are essentially the 1.3 million that Matt or I or, um, you know, Alderman Austin down on the south side, who has a much larger ward, um, we all get the same amount of money. And I think the administration was looking for ways to increase that funding so we can repair streets or some of the lights that we want to do. Um, even when you're in a pandemic and even when you're, uh, you're in difficult financial situations like this, we still need to keep our infrastructure up to date. The Trump administration has not done a single infrastructure bill in the whole time he's been in office. And I don't think that Biden's going to be able to pull one together until maybe the end, of, you know, third or fourth quarter of the year. Um, so we can't rely on that um, type of infrastructure funding to come in. But um, the, the mayor put together a five-year plan. I think that's the way things should be done, like other cities do a five or 10-year plan. A lot of it is everything from um, you know, adding more bike lanes and not, not bike lanes in itself, but like increasing the, uh, the accessibility and the safety of all of our streets, um, the Vision Zero program. And then um, you've got the, the bridges, the viaducts, the pavement resurfacing. That's a huge, it, it is a pretty significant amount of funding over a five-year period. Um, uh, but I think we're having discussions and disagreement on you know, what we really need in some cases and, uh, you know, jokingly out there that I think they were adding what they call a green alley to our list of menu items. And some of us were kind of going, we don't want, we don't want to have, um, you know, that extra funding for a green, green alley. We'd like to do something else with it. Um, you know, those things don't always work very well, but um, yeah, so there's just some disagreements around the edges on that as well. And I think uh, what I would add is, um, if, I guess to be frank, if anything should be tied to CPI or some other inflation metric, it should be expenses like this because that 1.32 million that every ward gets that Scott mentioned uh, up until what is likely to, to change, bump up slightly to 1.5, it's been flat for the better part of 10 years. And so um, one, the cost of a lot of things, including concrete related services has gone up significantly. But then when you look at places, not just Carrie's ward, um, but Sue's ward, you can fit five north side wards within Sue's single ward. And so it really shows the sort of inequities. And when Sue's ward is a, is a little bit different, obviously a decent um, Latinx population, but a lot of her neighboring wards are predominantly black, uh, increasing in size over the last number of years due in part to an exodus. And so it's just really compounding the equity issues. So... Uh, this is, it would be a challenging thing to do in the short term, but I think where we ultimately need to get is holding folks harmless, doing more of what the administration is pro proposing in so far as certain things that are just basic, you don't need to use menu on, we need to be thinking about it more comprehensively from a central planning standpoint, which will be helpful. But then when we are looking at our menu program, it should be based more on the size of the ward, or at least the geography that you would use menu funds on so that um, Sue, Carrie, Anthony Beal, and others um, have funds that are more reflective of their needs. And so um, smaller wards um, with being held harmless, um, you know, get, get what they need. So that's where, you know, we're, we're inching 
that way. Um, hopefully we can get closer to that before too long. That now just from my van, that's a slippery slope as former all of the 49th ward, a much smaller geographical area than the 41st ward. And they got a, what, 10 times more income. Their streets are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, well, it is, think, it's a slippery yeah. slope how you do that. But again, I, we don't have to dwell on I, it. <laughs> I think the the, uh, the bigger issue here too, that um, you, you know this mayor also has this Invest Southwest program. And, um, I know maybe hey, logistically it's not. Out, sure. Well, the mayor's basically said, look, you know, we've we've not had investments in these neighborhoods, the ones or the wards that um, Matt just mentioned and, and across the west side and the southwest side. Take out, you know, a couple of them there, like maybe the I'm not saying the 14th ward is not in need, but um, might have gotten some things lined up before everybody else down there, but there has to be a focus on the neighborhoods that have been disinvested from for decades. And, um, you know, probably since the time of Errol Washington. So I think it's good that the mayor had walked into office and said, I'm invest in Southwest. We're going to focus our funds over there. And I've had personal discussions with her and many of her staff um, where I've said, look, I don't, I don't need those things in my ward. I don't need you to be sitting there putting um, big projects on the table, for instance, um, in the Lincoln Yards area, which is all on the edge. You know, they deliberately cut it off on my side of the road, which that's great, you know, but um, what do you, you know, what are we doing to push back on those, uh, those types of projects that are pie in the sky or a Hudson Yards type thing that are just, you know, internally focused um, mega developments. And how do we get those resources? How do I say, let's reject those in our area and let's make sure those resources go into the South uh, West investment funds that you want. And I think, I think they've been listening. So I think there'll be more to come out of that with um, how we approach those mega TIFs, mega projects that have the TIFs. So is this budget gonna pass? Yeah, I think I think it'll pass. I I think it's um, you know, everybody was like, "Are you worried about passing this out of budget or out of finance or whatever it might be?" And I I was kind of saying, "I I would love to pass it, obviously, but um, if aldermen have concerns and and they vote the way that they wish, then then that's the way it is." And I think the good thing is here that even though the mayor's been uh, you know using some tough words and has since maybe Matt can speak to it better, but since you know, um, maybe apologized or, or done something to alleviate those concerns. I think having people um, given the opportunity to speak freely and really, you know, work through the, work through the different budget sessions. Um, Pat Dow ran the best budget uh, sessions I've seen in a long time, even though they were on, on Zoom. So I, I Tell Alderman, you know, feel free to vote the way you wish, um, and you know you'll you'll still be fine coming out on the other end, no matter how you vote. But I think it'll pass. Yeah, I, I think it'll pass too. Um, I, I think it's been heartening to see the the space publicly and privately for disagreement, um, and disagreement where you're not you're not demonizing somebody, but saying, hey, like I just. I don't see things the same way that you do. And I think a good example being, as I mentioned earlier, Daniel Espada's proposal around like TIF usage, you know, you can use those funds now, you can use them later and let's talk about that. And, and where there are disagreements, that's okay. Let's not shy away from it because when we're pushing against one another, I think we all benefit as a result. Um, where I would like to see continued improvement and to Scott's point, I think we've seen both with the finance committee and the budget committee, we're moving in the right direction in this regard is to, um, foreground these issues earlier so that it's not so condensed over a month-long period where there isn't enough time, but also to be able to look at the budget more broadly, knowing that a lot of things are locked in, right? Pension obligations, debt responsibilities. Um, I, I think we can only do zero-based budgeting so many times, um, but really being able to say, hey, how can we have a budget that best better reflects both our values, but also our needs? Because I think you hear from folks in different parts of the city frustrations in terms of services that they feel 
aren't aren't being adequately met, but then feeling like they're being nickeled and dimed in ways that we've already discussed earlier. So if we can have more consistent conversations throughout the year, um, given more time for different city council members to really flesh out their ideas, hopefully that means at the end of the day, we're not arguing about where to allocate a hundred thousand here or a million there, but some of the more significant issues that really reflect the challenges. And so I think we're we're moving in the right direction there. Obviously, we I'd love for us to move more quickly, um, but we've got fifty folks, and then everybody that's in the mayor's administration. Um, so that takes time. Um, but I think, um, regardless of how folks end up voting, I think that. We, we have seen meaningful movement on a number of issues and um, let's make sure we capitalize on it going forward. Okay. Um, Morgan, did we have other, um, you know, I mean, we've touched on most of the questions, but was there other things? I know it must be close to eight o'clock. Yeah, no, we're right up on eight o'clock now. And, and we've, uh, we've addressed the questions that have come in tonight and, and the issues that people are really talking about in the chat. So that's fantastic. Um, so let's close it out uh, and give everyone the rest of their evening. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Alderman, for joining us. And thanks to everyone in our audience for being here as well. Um, we are going to be posting a recording of this, uh, of this event in uh, probably in a few days. You'll get an email when that's posted. It'll be on our website at goodgovernmentillinois.com. And we will also share it out on our Facebook and Twitter feeds. So make sure you're following us and make sure you're on our email list to get all of that good information, as well as the information about our next virtual town hall, which we'll be announcing shortly. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, David. Great job, guys. Thanks so much. We should send this video around to all those progressive cities to see that we have some very talented aldermen right here in Chicago. <laughs> Thank you all. Take care. Good night.